Pray is that today as we worship, whether you're worshiping at home or you're worshiping in in church itself, to focus our attention on Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let us worship him. The call to worship this morning comes from Koran. God for us, we call you Father. God alongside us, we call you Jesus. God within us, we call you Holy Spirit. We come in joy to celebrate and worship God in this sacred space where countless people have known God's glorious presence. We come in expectation to celebrate and worship God in this sacred space where we can experience God's perfect peace. We come in trust to celebrate and worship God in this sacred space because here we are challenged to faithfulness. We give thanks for the God who understands and loves us and who hears our fears, our tears, and our songs of praise.
Dear Lord and Guardian of our wonderful universe, we are very disturbed by the inhumane behavior of some children towards their elderly parents. We confess that we have observed this for quite some time and kept quiet and didn't do much when we could have assisted. We confess that we many times turned a blind eye uh, on the miserable circumstances of elderly parents. Lord, we know very well that it's a very sensitive but unfortunate situation that many elderly parents find themselves in. We therefore want to pray for a new era of respect for elderly parents. Please, Lord, bring sanity to the perpetrators of these atrocities. We confess that we as parents don't always know how to guide our children and allow them to subtly abuse us. We pray for your mercy on the parents who are affected by such abuse. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Our scripture reading is from Philippians chapter 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Roaming by the mountainside at sundown, a wolf saw his own shadow and it became greatly extended and magnified. He said to himself, why should I, being of immense size and extending nearly an acre in length, be afraid of the lion? Ought I not to be acknowledged as the king of all beasts? While he was indulging in these thoughts, a lion fell upon him and killed him. He exclaimed with a too late repentance, Worthless me, this overestimation of myself is the cause of my destruction. Another tale. A scorpion is waiting on the shores of a river bank. And the reason he needs to cross over have been lost in the thousands of uh, retellings of this tale. But there sits the scorpion gazing at the distant shore when along comes a frog. Excuse me, sir, says the scorpion. Would you mind ferrying me to the other side of the river? The frog looks puzzlingly at the scorpion. What kind of fool do you think I am? asks the frog. The second I take you on my back to travel across the river, you will sting me and I will die. I understand, responds the scorpion, because usually that is the way with me and all of my kind, that our pointed tails prey on animals like you. But just think, posits the pleading predator, why would it benefit me to sting you while you carry me across the river? If I did, I would kill myself and then we would both assuredly drown. So please, pleaded the scorpion, carry me across the river. I promise we both will make it safely to the other side. The frog paused. He too had ingested his fair share of insects from time to time. And here was another creature, not only in need, but also with a thoughtful explanation of his plan. So the frog stared one last time into the scorpion's eyes and ultimately assented. Hop on my back. Sure enough, halfway across the river, the scorpion stings the frog. And just before the poison kicks in and they both drown, the frog asks the scorpion with his last breath, Why did you do that? To which the scorpion responds, You didn't really expect me to change, did you? Now this fable of the frog and the scorpion is as old as the first tale uh, Aesop, from Aesop's fables. The moral of the story is quite clear. We cannot change our nature. The moral of the story is, is antithetical actually though to the very reason we've come here this morning. Because we are not animals. We are moral individuals. 
Not only can human beings change their nature, but our faith says we can and do change for the better by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Our faith denies the defiant stance of the scorpion. And we're not allowed in our faith to throw up our hands and to, to simply say, um, I've lived this long, this is who I am, don't expect me to change. I know there are certain things that remain steady in our lives, but the Bible teaches us that we can change. It's our relationship with Jesus challenges us, challenges us to do just that which we fear, to change for the better. In an insightful book called The Road to Character, Brooks, David Brooks, asserts that our basic problem in our society is that we are self-centered. A plight perfectly captured, and he quotes David Foster Wallace, another David. So he says, our plight is that we are self-centered. And then he quotes a, a commencement address that an, an author by the name of David Foster Wallace gave uh, to Kenyon College. This is what he said. Everything in my own immediate existence supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realist, most vivid and important person in existence. You really think about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it is so socially repulsive. But it's pretty much the same for all of us. It's our default setting hardwired into our boards at birth. So David Foster Wallace is saying that he is the absolute center of the universe, the most important person in existence. Which reminded me of a problem I had with, a, with a, one of the books of the Alpha Course, where the writer, Nicky Gumbel, says that he was once looking up at the stars. He saw a star and he realized that God had created the stars just for him for that particular moment. Now, on the surface of it, it seems quite nice, a nice thought, sentimental. But actually, there's something wrong in this idea, this notion that God created everything just for him for that moment. It makes him the center of the universe. It's a very narcissistic phrase. Wallace thinks our default setting is that we are the center of the universe. It's similar to the myth of Narcissus, where he gazed into his own reflection in, in a lake and fell in love with himself. And sociologists tell us that people are becoming more and more narcissistic. Our faith challenges the assumption that any of us is the master of the universe. In fact, our scripture is pretty clear about the identity of the creator of the universe. And most certainly it's not us. So we need to understand and get perspective about where we fit in. Not in terms of acting like we are worms, but in understanding the reality of life. If anything, what we've been taught from the time of Adam and Eve who were put in the Garden of Eden to tend it and, and till it, to care for it, to nurture other creatures, is that we are stewards of this world, not masters. And that's a big distinction. The one is a servant role, and the other one is a ruling dominant role. We are members of this universe, of this cosmos, with remarkable responsibility that we have inherited from our relationship with Jesus. So instead of thinking of ourselves as the crown of creation, we need to see ourselves as just part of the creation. Our faith would have us deny or ignore the narcissism that dominates our day. It would force us to see our role in our world quite differently. Only a fool could contemplate all of creation and see themselves as the master of the cosmos. Moses Maimonides said bluntly, Only an ignoramus imagines that everything exists for his own sake. Only an ignoramus imagines it is as if nothing exists except him. Our faith demands that we realize 
what we already know to be true. We didn't create the universe. We're a small part of the great chain of history. This is beautifully illustrated by a sculpture that was done uh, for the Turbine Hall in the Tate Museum in London by Anish Mikhail Kapoor, a British sculptor specializing in installation art and conceptual art. He was asked to do a sculpture and he, made, he was asked to make use of the full space of the hall. Now the hall is 10 stories high, 150 meters long, and he was asked to do a sculpture and he made a sculpture of three rings. Two large rings were fixed on either end of the hall, one perpendicular to them, and they were joined together by a red PVC membrane, which creates the impression that they are held together. It's a, it's a beautiful red membrane that fills this entire massive space. His most important focus, according to him, was that the viewer could never have a complete view of the sculpture. It was embedded in, a hall, in the hall in such a way that Marcias, as it was called, couldn't be viewed fully under any circumstances. He wanted to create a work that would remain mysterious and never reveal the real plan. It's very thought-provoking and perceptive. You get a different view from every different place, but never the complete view. And this is a metaphor for human life. One can know the many different sides of a situation, but one can never really get the complete picture. People piece together the different parts of a situation in different ways and develop the, their image in their mind. Each image is different from everyone else's image despite seeing the same thing. So what I'm looking at with us is that we need to see the bigger picture. It's often larger than we think and we know less than we actually think. In Christian theology, what this is called, this awareness of the greatness of God and the smallness of us is called kenosis. Literally, the act of emptying ourselves. The word is used in Philippians especially. It's a word which describes the self-emptying of Jesus and becoming entirely receptive to the will of God. It's used in Philippians 2.7. Jesus made himself nothing, emptied himself. It uses the word kenu, which is the word to empty. And it's a word that describes something, emptying something out, depleting as opposed to filling. It occurs five times in the New Testament. And of these, of these uh, well, the verb occurs five times in Romans, Colossians, and in 2 Corinthians and in Philippians. The most of these occurrences are in Philippians 2 verse 7, in which Jesus is said to have emptied himself which is the starting idea of the Christian idea of kenosis, of self-empty. John the Baptist displayed this attitude when he said of Jesus, he must become greater and I must become lesser. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. So we see the pattern and we are disciples of Jesus. So we follow him. And what did he do? He said he's gentle and humble in heart. He's telling us to follow his example of humility. And if we do, we will find rest. Pride and arrogance throw us into tension and to turmoil. But humility allows us to rest from that competitive spirit. Now, this is not simply a moral encouragement. This is about being like Jesus. It's, it's about being a disciple, reflecting him, being humble as Jesus was. Empty yourself as Jesus did. So I read the verse in, in Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard 
Equality with God is something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. So in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Well, what is that mindset? Well, the, the passage in, in Philippians is like a hymn. It's a, like a hymn of everything Jesus did. This is his calling. This is his trajectory. This is his purpose. It is where he was, where he went, and where he is now. Where he was. Well, he was in nature God. He had the being of God. The Greek term is very strong. He had the same being as God. He was equal to God. He was God. But he didn't hold on to his equality. But he had equality. There was absolutely nothing illegitimate about it. But he didn't hold on to it. He was equal with the Father. Equal in power. Equal in omnipotence. Equal in omniscience. He was an equal being with the Father. So he had the nature of God. But then it says in verse 7, He made himself nothing and took on another nature by taking the nature of not just a human being who was an aristocrat, but a human being who was a servant. That is not a wealthy, powerful human being, but one who was simple, one who was actually poor, one who was very vulnerable, and one who went to the cross and died. So what kind of humility are we called upon to imitate? Well, firstly, humility is an approach. It is a hoden, as they say in, in, in Afrikaans. It is, or in Dutch, hoding. What is your hoding, your relationship, your posture towards God? Someone said, the seeker after truth should be humbler than the dust. The world crushes the dust under its feet. But the seeker after truth should be so humble himself that even the dust could crush him. Only then and not till then will we have a glimpse of the truth. So our posture as Christians is to be humble. The second thing I want to say about humility is humility is a Jesus approach. So if we want to understand what our posture to the world is, posture to people, because of course that's what we're talking about here, relationships with people, we have to have the attitude of Jesus, the primary posture of Jesus to the world. And what that is, in one word, it's something I mentioned before, it's the word condescending. Condescending. Now, I know nowadays, in modern use, condescending is to look down upon someone else. But it originally is a word that that speaks about making a gracious allowance for, to yield deferentially, to agree, to consent, to come down from one's rights or claims. From, it comes from the Latin word condescendere, to let oneself down, to stoop. It's a sense of volunt a voluntary waving, of, waving aside of ceremonies or dignity proper to your position or rank, and are willing to assume equality with inferiors or people who are less than you. It's an onomatopoeic word. In other words, it sounds like it, it is condescending. It's what Jesus did when he became human. He condescended. He came down and became equal with us. He let us aside his rights, his power, and he became one with us. One flesh, embracing all of us. Karl Barth once said, In his condescension, in which he gives himself to us in Jesus Christ, he exists and speaks and acts as the one who was from all eternity and will be to all eternity. Colbert's saying an amazing thing here. He's saying that the humility of Jesus is actually the nature of God. It's actually the nature of God to be humble, to condescend, to come alongside even his small creation. 
as it says in the scripture, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Condescension. The third thing I want to say about humility is humility is sober. The book of Romans admonishes us to say, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Do not be proud, do not be conceited. This is an attitude that we need to cultivate. And it's different to the attitude of, say, Uriah Heep in Charles Dickens, who, even the name Charles Dickens, also an onomatopoeic word, Uriah Heep. In other words, he was a heap, like a heap of dung. And every time Uriah Heep comes to talk, he says, Oh, I'm ever so humble. I'm so humble. I'm so humble. I'm the humblest man alive. I'm so humble. And actually, we, we find out very soon that he's actually not that humble. There's something deceptive about that. Here we are talking about a sober honesty about who we are. Not seeing ourselves as worms, but seeing ourselves as humans. Seeing ourselves in the context of the universe. Fourth thing about humility is be realistic. See yourself as you are, not greater or lesser. Epictetus once says, If anyone tells you that a certain person speaks ill of you, do not make excuses about what is said of you, but answer, He was ignorant of my other faults, else he would not have mentioned these alone. Fifthly, humility is unclenching. Humility doesn't grasp onto things. Years ago, there was a movie by uh, Jamie Ace uh, in which there was an, an animal, a monkey, who was nearby a, a, a tree where there were fruit. And some of the fruit had fallen into a little hole in a rock. And the monkey had reached into the rock to grab the fruit. You could see the monkey holding onto the fruit. The problem is, was that as long as the monkey held onto the fruit, he couldn't pull his arm out. His arm was too big to come now out of the hole. And so this monkey was struggling in trying to get his hand out, holding onto the fruit, but he wouldn't let the fruit go because he, he felt that he, he wanted that fruit. He was grasping onto it. He was holding onto it. And because of that, he, he stayed in that position for hours and hours and hours. If we're grasping onto something, we cannot see all the fruit that is around us. Humility is also open, said sixthly. It's open to relationship and to others. It's the opposite of prejudice. To be humble is to be open to relationships and to other people, not close to them based on whatever we, our judgment of them is. Seventhly, humility is teachable. As Christians, we cannot grow if we're not teachable. Sometimes we learn certain patterns, we learn certain things, and they're very difficult to unlearn. We hold on to them as truths. But not even the scripture, not even God can change our hearts. But we need to be open. We need to be like malleable clay that God can mold and make into his own image. Let us be teachable. Eighthly, humility is being aware of self-deception. Judge not lest you be judged. Humility is not taking up a place of judgment. You cannot judge if you're humble. If you condescend, if you come alongside of people, you, you are as human as you are. You cannot judge others. When you judge others, you take a God perspective. You think of yourself as much higher than you actually are. Now, I want to point out very strongly that these things that we are encouraged to do are not things that we just do out of our own. We do it because of our relationship with Jesus. Jesus, at being close with us, allows us, by the power of the Spirit, to become humble, to grow in our humility. And we do that by obedience. We listen to God and we follow Him. We listen to God and we follow him. The focus of Jesus was on the Father's will, not on his own. Jesus said in John 6 verse 38, 
for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. He also prayed as he was facing the cross. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So if we're going to belong to Jesus and be like Jesus, we have to come to the place where we live to do the will of the one who made us and sent us into the world to live out his purposes. We are no longer our own. Human pride is that which will not unbend, which will not stoop to that which is beneath it. And I close with something that Karl Barth said, and listen carefully, it's, it's magnificent. He said, God is not proud. His high, in his high majesty, he is humble. It is in this high humility that he speaks and acts as the God who reconciles the world to himself. God is immutably the one whose reality is seen in his condescension in Jesus Christ. He is not a God who is what he is in a majesty behind this condescension, behind the cross on Golgotha. So what Bart is saying here is quite powerful. It's, it's, it sounds like a complex uh, quote, and it is, but he's saying basically there's not some other majesty behind the condescension of Jesus. There's not something more powerful behind the humility of Jesus. That is the power. That is God. So as we look at the cross, we don't look beyond the cross to the power of God. We see the power of God, who God really is in the cross. Let us pray. Gracious God, teach us to be humble. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.
may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God.